Okay. Good morning. And if um, if you need a, a handout, this week I've included um, some the pictures in a handout. So if you can't see things up there, it'll be a little bit easier to see them on a handout. So if you want a handout, I've got one for you. Oh, okay. And what happened to our slides? Oh, there we go, there we go, there we go. <clears throat> okay, good morning. <clears throat> um, welcome, I'm Ken Junkins. I'm your leader for this eight-week course. This is the second week. Uh, Eyes to see, ears to hear, group meditation on great paintings. And um, just a, a reminder that uh, this is a meditation course. So did you guys get a hand out back here? Let me get you one. <clears throat> there we go. There you go. Oop. That um, was developed my, by my friend, the Dr. Reverend Ron Rosenau. So, oh, there we go. Okay. No, no. We give it to our tech. Sure, you don't want me to use the handheld? Okay. There we go. Don't touch that no matter what I do. Fuzzy. Okay. I will talk loud anyway. Oh boy, that sounds terrible. <clears throat> Rick, I'd like to have a handheld. Is that okay? Oh, thanks. <clears throat> Divina, spiritual One. meditation One. on art. This is a modified version. Each I have no idea what it's doing, but we're going to change it just a There we go. This is a little better. Thank you. And uh, and we'll meditate on those texts. And then we'll look at uh, a couple of paintings, and we'll meditate on those paintings. And to remind you that last session, we talked about the way we will um, approach paintings. We'll, be, we'll look at them and we'll ask the question, what do you see? It's a very literal question. We'll talk about what we actually see in the image. And then, what do you feel? We'll talk about our, our emotions that, that um, we're feeling about the painting. What do you wonder about? And maybe we'll explore some questions about the painting or the art. And what do you think? And uh, that's the way we'll approach that. And we, yeah, let's leave the slides up, I think. So week two is, you looking at me? Are you looking at me? So uh, for the text portion of this, I'll start by reading the text. Sometimes um, just listening helps us approach it a little bit better. And then I will put the text back up on the screen, plus I think you have it in your hand out there as well. Um, so the first text that we're going to uh, listen to, to hear, is Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy 5, verses 6 through 9. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, 
out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath, under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. Okay, again, you can read along if you like. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. So this um, is the first of the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and he brought them down out of the mountain uh, to the people of Israel. What is an idol? A, a what? An 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 animate object that you worship. Anything that absorbs your time and talent and treasure that takes you away from what? From God. Okay, uh, a thing that we prioritize um, in our life. And um, the dictionary says that it's a noun, an image or other material object representing a deity to which religious worship is addressed. I think in the vernacular we sometimes, um, you know, put it to money or movie stars or something like that. Um, we don't often elevate them to a level higher than God, but um, you know, very specifically an idol is something that um, is an image of a deity other than God. And, and God is saying that, um, and biblically we're saying any person or thing regarded with blind admiration, adoration, or devotion other than God. So what God is saying is that um, you know, don't devote your adoration, your, uh, your life to anything other than me. I am, I am the Lord your God. Don't make an idol a physical thing. Don't set a person up above me. Um, and, um, and he says, uh, you know, I'll remember that if you do. Um, so, you know, in, in the passage uh, in the Bible, 
while Moses and Aaron are away, the, the people of Israel make a golden calf and they worship that because they don't think Moses is coming back. And when he comes back, he, he's angry and God's angry, of course. So, you know, making, making things and then worshiping them is what really sets a thing apart as an idol. Um, making a thing uh, does not necessarily make it an idol until you revere it above God, until you worship it. Right? Um, all right, so our next, okay, there we go. I forgot that I put that up there. So there's your d descriptions. Um, our second text, we do have two texts today, is Colossians 1, 15 through 20. And I will uh, listen to it. It will listen to it, and then I will put it up on the screen again. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so he, that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him, all the fullness of God is well, yeah. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven by making peace through the blood of the cross. So as we listen to this, this is Paul writing to the Colossians and he is talking about whom? Jesus Christ, yes. So, you know, we talked about an idol being um, something that is uh, an image of a deity or something that we worship other than God. So if Jesus is the, in, the image of the invisible God, is Jesus an idol? Is the cross an idol? Well, yeah. Well, let's let's talk a little bit uh, first. Of, uh, so, cross and other things that are parts and symbols of the church. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about Jesus Himself. He's de described as the image of the invisible God. So. Being an image of the invisible God, does that set him in the realm of being an idol as opposed to God? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So we have to remember, so those are all good points. We have to remember that Jesus is God incarnate, right? So God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, we talk about a triune God. So Jesus is God incarnate on earth. That means that he is not and cannot be an idol because... He is God, right? But then that begs the question, is an image, a painting of Jesus, because if Jesus is is God, is an image of, of Jesus an idol then? So, yes, only if you worship the image. Do you remember that last week we talked about, I mean last session we talked about um, Rene Marguerite's painting of the pipe and it said on there, this is not a pipe. Rene Marguerite was making the point that the image, the art, is not the thing, right? If the art is not the thing, then an image of Jesus is not Jesus and it is not an idol unless we make it an idol. If I have a statue of Mary, if I have a cross, if I have a painting of Jesus, and I worship that above God, it is an idol. But if it is just an image of God, a a place of focus for us to um, point our prayers and imagine, you know, God or Jesus with us while we pray to God or talk to God, then that is not an idol. So it's how humans approach the object, the art, the painting, that would venerate it to be an idol or not an idol. It's, it's how we, you know, deal with it. It does, just by its own uh, existence, doesn't make it an idol. So that being said, I think you've probably all seen this. I think most Christians have seen this painting. This is a painting by Warner Salman called Head of Christ. Um, So never mind the title of the painting and it was painted in 1940, 1940. We're gonna approach the painting as as we've approached all the art so far. We're going to ask these questions. What do we see? A man. We see intensity. I think we, I think intensity might be in the emotion part, the feel, but we can, I guess we can see some intensity maybe. Focus, did somebody say focus? Yeah, where where is this man's energy focused? I'm sorry, so beyond himself, towards God. We don't know if it's towards God. We don't see that as towards God. We might think that later on, but yeah, it's, his energy is focused over there, off there somewhere, right? Um, he's a man, he's got a beard, he's got long flowing hair. He has brown eyes, let's look closely, let's look closely. He has blue eyes, okay? Um, 
I did this blow up of this, and I looked at it and I said, that could be a portrait of George Washington, couldn't it? If, if you didn't see all the rest of it, you could look at that and say, that's, that's a portrait of George Washington. Um, blue eyes, yes. There's illumination behind him, good. He's got a white robe. What's that? Right, so we're stepping to a little bit of conclusion about who it is, and, and that is because um, the title is Head of Christ, right? We, we, um, we don't know that, um, that this is a true, this is Warner Salmon's representation. We don't know that this is a true representation of Christ, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the, the emotion, the feeling there. What do we feel? We feel intensity, right? Do we feel, do we feel awe? Do we feel closeness? I don't know. What are your feelings about this painting? Very solemn. Solemn. Right. There's not really a lot of energy in the in the painting, right? He's just there. Let's see. I have a checklist. Um, and we'll do this with the next painting, too. Let's go down the checklist. Does he have a beard? Yes. Does he have long brown hair? Yes. Does he have a white robe? Yes. Is he Caucasian? Caucasian? The person in this painting is, is kind, of, kind of appears rather Caucasian, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Without, without, without our background, as we look at this, you know, we, we know this is Jesus, but would a child know this is Jesus? That's a good question, yeah. Is he well-kept what? <laughs> yeah. He's, could be Iranian, maybe, yeah. Uh, uh, does he have a far-off mystical gaze? He does seem. Um, does he have a full-on face-to-face look? No, not really. Not here. He's not looking at me. Um, is he detached? Yeah, he doesn't. To me, he doesn't seem engaged with me. He doesn't seem connected to me. He does seem detached, right? Hmm? Yeah. Um, is do you get a sense of do not disturb me, or do you get a sense of come and join me and hang out with me? Yeah, do not disturb me is kind of there's almost a barrier there. There's almost like you know I, I have a a wall up in front of me or something, right? So. Warner Salmon was a um, commercial artist and illustrator in the 40s. And in the 40s, of course, we were, um, World War II was ending. We were approaching the Cold War. We had a lot of insecurity about um, ourselves in our nation. And Warner Salmon, Salmon painted this painting um, for a, a church bulletin or newsletter or something like that, and it went out, and it got immediate response, and a lot of people saw this and really were attached to it, and ultimately, over time, this is why you've seen it before, probably, over 500 million copies of this painting went out in publications, in prayer cards, in memorial cards. Paint, reproductions of this painting were hung in many churches across this country, and this was, for Americans, the image of Jesus. This is what we would think about as we were worried about world troubles, wars in other countries, 
you know, are people going to come and get me? Um, is, you know, am, am I able to take care of my family? Is my health okay? You know, people would look at this, and this was their connection to Jesus. Does that make this an idol? It kind of depends on how people approached it. You know, if you look at this and you know it's a painting and, you've, and you use it to, to set in your mind an image of a person that you are praying to and, and talking to, but you still know that God is, and Jesus, and the, you know, the triune God is who you are praying to, then it's, then it's not an idol, you know. If, if you treat this as a holy relic, you know, and you're getting close to the area of being an idol. Now, as we grew up in this country, and um, things changed, oh, let, me, let me see here. Um, let's, okay, we went to feel. What do we wonder about? You know, we, we, we talked about who this is, but who was the model? I wonder about who the model was for this, but who Warner Selman looked at when he painted this. Do you have any other questions, any th other things that you wonder about about this? Yeah, I wonder what, I wonder what Jesus is thinking. Yeah. His focus does, does appear to be um, ethereal or otherworldly. You know, it's not, he's, it, his focus is not on us. It's not on earthly issues. It's on, on prayer or on God. Right. So unless there is unless there is specific reference, we don't know what he's thinking about, and we project, right? We do project. Right. So regardless of what Warner Selman's thoughts were when he painted this painting, we do project on, on this. And we might project a feeling of reverence uh, you know, to that because that's where we're at. Um, or it, we might project a feeling of coldness and distance because that's where we're at personally, right? So we wonder about what he's thinking about. Um, we wonder who he's looking at, yeah. Um, just a couple of references. The painting is said to have become the basis for the visualization of Jesus for hundreds of millions of people. And like I said, over 500 million copies of this were distributed um, you know, nationally and worldwide. Um, and uh, um, historian David Morgan explains that for many Christians during the Cold War, Solomon's portrait did symbolize a virile, manly Christ. But also for others, it embodied a more intimate and nurturing Jesus, um, a personal savior for modern times. You know. So however, however we approach the painting is how it connects to us personally, right? So then, in 1964, Richard Hook, an illustrator of many um, Christian and religious paintings, um, if you've picked up a, uh, a child's Bible, illustrated Bible, you've probably seen 
some of his paintings. But in 64, he painted this painting. It's called Head of Christ. What do we see? A man. A young, young man, so younger maybe than the other image that we saw, right? Friendly. We, okay. So we don't see friendly, and we'll, and we'll get to that, but I think, I think that you're on the right track there. But why do we think it's, why do we think it's friendly? Because where's, where's his energy? Yeah, he's looking at us. Yeah, and somebody said he smiles. He smiles too. So he, his his mouth. The other one had a more stiff upper lip. This one he has a, a smile. So he's got long hair again. He's got a beard. He's wearing a white robe. A little bit of a glow behind him. Not so much as the one the other one, but yeah. 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 So maybe a little bit darker, darker skinned. Um, this one definitely has brown eyes. Yeah. Sunburned. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting because the alternative title for this painting is Surfer Jesus. In the '60s, of course, we were all hip and swinging and. And that's what we wanted to be was those cool surfer guys down in California, right? Um, so again, let's see. Uh, let's go down the checklist. Does he have a beard? Yes. Long brown hair? Yes. A white robe? Yes. Is he Caucasian? Maybe. Um, yeah, he does. He does still feel kind of Caucasian, but but there's a little bit more. It's a little less defined. It's he's got tanner skin maybe and brown eyes so he could be almost semitic maybe um far off mystical gaze no that was the other guy he's looking right at you right he's engaging with you he's right there detached no engaged yes um do not disturb me or come on and be my friend what do you think Come on and be my friend, right? Stiff upper lip? No, smile, yes, right? So, so same subject matter, different interpretation, and our feelings about this have changed. How, what do we, how do we feel about this? Now somebody, what did, we, what, what did you say before, Bobby? Friendly. We feel that we could be his friend, right? Or he could be our friend. He's engaged, yeah. Yeah. Right, right, focus to the people. We, we, we feel that we're part of that conversation, right? We're not, we're not looking at, um, we're not looking at a mystic who's in a, in a trance com communing with the other worldly places and things. We're here with this person. We're we're right connected with them. He's he's part of the part of our world, right? What else do we feel here? Approachable. Approachable. That's really good. Yeah. And when I look at this, I feel uh, specifically opposed to the other painting. The other painting, I feel no energy. What? What Jesus in that other painting is doing is all cerebral. He's, this Jesus is talking to me, coming to me. There's energy flowing out of him. All right. What do we wonder about? How old he is, yeah. What is he about to tell us or to talk to us about? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if I could, yeah, if I could paraphrase then for you, he, he's more down to earth, more, you know, let's get involved in things kind of thing, right? He, just another, yeah, yeah. So Richard Hook and his, and his wife Frances created a lot of uh, warm and winning images of Christ for the modern viewers of the 60s. And it corresponded for many more closely to the personal savior of evangel evangel evangelical Christianity. Um, when Hooks took up the sacred commercial art, the field was dominated by one special image of Jesus, the one we saw before, which is Warner Salman's head of Christ. The backlit celebrity photo-like portrait of Nordic featured beautifully coiffed Christ was viewed as too uh, effeminate for the swinging 60s. This Jesus is, is more you know, manly. Surfer Jesus gets out there on the waves and rides those waves, right? And, and that's what people were looking for in the 60s. Richard met the need for more masculine Jesus with his own rugged suburb, sunbird, and they say somewhat Semitic looking, so, you know, because he's a, you know, I guess that's, that's more opinionated, but, um, uh, so, uh, his, his was a dynamic good shepherd who carried no rod nor staff to get his flock through the fearsome valleys. Francis also challenged conventional pious portraiture with images of an accessible savior who laughed and doted on always adorable children. Let's look at this other picture that was painted two years earlier by Richard Hook. Jesus with the children, adorable children golden blonde hair, children. <laughs> um, so these are the types of portraits, um, but um, in every way, uh, the, his portraits uh, embodied the popular hymn title, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So looking at these two pictures, are either or both of these a compelling image of Jesus Christ? Yeah, both, both. Um, right, nobody knows, right? That was 2,000 years ago. You would or would not? You would not. And why? Hmm. Yeah. The essence, yeah, I like that. Is is the essence of Jesus there for you? We know it's Jesus when we look at it, but is it compelling, you know? So again, we all approach art differently, but you know, this 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 type of art defined, at least for us in America, what we think of as Jesus Christ, you know, because it was so prolific. And yet there's so much more art in the world that depicts Jesus and his disciples and his world, and we need to explore some of that. That's, that's a good point, and just, just for the recording purposes, you said that the more images, the more varied and diverse images that we would have seen of Jesus, the more approachable he becomes, the more, um, the more we engage with him. That's a really good point, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. The memorial cards, this is the image they use, the one on the left, yep. Yep. And there's, and there's plenty of churches that still have this hanging on their wall, maybe even in their sanctuary, you know, right?
Well, that's true, yeah. Bet between photographs and or paintings, um, no one image necessarily captures the essence of us. So how could we possibly expect <clears throat> one painting of Jesus or even two paintings of Jesus to capture the ens essence of him, of Jesus, right? Fourteen twenty-five. Fourteen twenty-five. You might want to look at your handout because this image is um, difficult to see on the screen. But uh, Andrei Rublev painted this called the Trinity, and this is an icon. We're going to talk about what an icon is in a minute, but let's talk about what we see in this image. Three women. They have wings. Three angels. Yeah. Three angels with halos or an aura, yeah, around their head. They all have some article of blue clothing, yes. Yep, it looks like they have braided hair. Darker skin. There is a bowl on the table. If you could see the image, Clearly enough, it would be a calf's head. What's, um, what's, uh, what's in the background behind them? Can you see that? Above this leftmost one, what's behind that person? A building or a home, yeah. What's, what's behind the middle person? A tree? Hardest to see of all, what's behind the rightmost person? Somebody said an animal, somebody said, yeah, it's hard to tell, it's actually a mountain. They have wings, right? It's a mountain, yeah. It's just, it's pretty funky. They are sitting on chairs, right? Or thrones, maybe. There's a table there as well. They're holding something, yeah, a rod or a, a reed, maybe. Let's look at the, uh, the figures of the angels are interestingly arranged. If, if we saw them in physical space, they are arranged in a, in a circle. They are sitting in a circle. So can you see what their hands are doing? Uh, particularly the leftmost and the center angel. The leftmost angel is really hard to see, but hand is, hand is like this. And the centermost one also is doing this, that's, that's a symbol of a blessing. So their hands are in, the, in the, are blessing something. Um, where are they looking? Yeah, they're almost, almost not looking anywhere, it's almost contemplation, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, you, you look out at the congregation, yeah. Yep, uh, yeah, yep, yep, they are, very good. Um, okay. 
One other interesting thing I'll point out is the, the shape of the empty space in between them. Um, it's almost cup-shaped. It comes like this. Okay, just be aware of that. We'll talk about that. What do we feel when we look at this painting? <laughs> it's old, but what do we feel? The title is, or the hospitality of Abraham. Yeah, I'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's do we do we feel that it's like reverential? It's 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 calm. Do we feel calm, quiet here? Is the energy kind of low key in this? They look sad. They do look sad. They. A feeling of sadness, a feeling of um, contemplation, maybe. Anything else we feel when we look at this? So, what do what do we wonder about? Peggy's wondering about um, what you just say a minute ago, Peggy. You said. Yeah, the title. We're wondering about the Trinity uh, and also called the hospitality of Abraham, right? You know that what? Right. <clears throat> Let's see. This, uh, this from, from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran out from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread and you may refresh yourselves. And after, you may, and after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do, have you, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened to the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quick, quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. So if that passage applies to this painting... The house on the left is Abraham's house or tent. The tree in the middle is the oak of Mamre. And the mountain, I don't know if I get this right. Do, do, do. Um... Well, there's a mountain in this, <laughs> near, the, near the plains of Mamre, and I can't remember what it is, so. <laughs> At any rate, that helps to explain a little bit the picture. Um, the painting uh, was done by uh, Andrei Rublev, uh, uh, an Orthodox, a Russian Orthodox iconographer, and icons are... Um, Icons are representa representations of some sacred personage, as Christ or a saint or angel, painted usually on wood surface and venerated itself as sacred. Um, and we can appreciate in the icon the fact that the, that the viewer forgets he is front of a certain surface that acts as a wall. That's, that's kind of the way the iconographers work. So there were many, particularly in the Byzantine era, there were many, many, in the 4th, 5th, 7th centuries, many, many iconographers who were painting scenes uh, from the Bible. Um, 
One of the interesting things about many icons is the, the way that the uh, realism is broken down. We looked at some paintings like the painting of Whistle Jacket last, last time, the horse, and how realistic it looked. When we look at this painting, we look at the, um, the perspective of these chairs. This is called reverse perspective. Instead of, instead of the lines going off into the distance, and it's, it's hard for me as, a, as an artist to look at this and understand this because I'm used to drawing in, in real perspective, the kind of perspective that our cameras see. Their perspective is different in that the lines converge in front of the painting instead of in the back of the painting. And this is a, an intentional um, process. Yes, Kathy? So the effect of that, yes, exactly, exactly. What Kathy said is, um, is that it, it looks as if I'm the fourth person in this painting. And that's exactly right, that the point of the, of the reverse perspective brings, that, brings things out in front of the painting and includes you in it. So now you are also a guest at the table. That's very good. So that's a good question because the biblical verse is that they are three men. Abraham sees three men. And um, so what Rubelev has done here is sort of painted them in a nondescript way. We're seeing them as effeminate, uh, non-masculine maybe, but they really they really don't have gender. As being ethereal angels of another realm, you know, they're different than us, so we're not ascribing gender necessary to them, and we may read them as more effeminate um, or nondescript, really. So there's also symbolism in here, and that is that the three also represent the Holy Trinity. So this is, this is not specifically rendered that way, but, um, but when Rublev painted this, in addition to the um, fact that there were three angels that visited Abraham, this painting also has symbology in it in that those three are the Holy Trinity. Now, having said that, I wonder which is which? Who do you think is which? Who do you think is Christ? Don says the center one. So on the left side of the painting, on the right hand of the, okay. So Peggy thinks it's so it, there are, other, there are other hints at, at this. So um, the central angel represents Jesus Christ, who in turn blesses the cup. Let's, let's back up. Let's say the left. Let's talk about the left angel. The left angel symbolizes God the Father. He blesses the cup, yet his hand is painted in a distance as if he passes the cup on to the central angel. Um, we also see the house behind that angel. It's Abraham's house, but it also could represent, you know, the house of my father, God's house. Then the central angel represents Jesus Christ, who in turn blesses the cup as well and accepts it with a bow as if saying, my father, if possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. That's from Matthew. And the Oak of Mamre behind that angel can be interpreted as the Tree of Life. So that's another symbol in the picture that indicates that that um, figure is, represents Jesus. 
It serves as a reminder of Jesus' death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection, which opens the way to eternal life. The oak is located in the center above the angel who symbolizes Jesus. And then that leaves the right angel as the Holy Spirit, and the symbol there is the mountain, the symbol of spiritual ascent, which mankind accomplishes with the help of the Holy Spirit. Um, the wings of the Father and the Son, the wings of these two angels, representing the Father and the Son, they overlap. That shows a, 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 a closeness, a bonding there. The wing, the wing of the, um, the Spirit just barely touches the other one. Um, so another, I think Don had mentioned blue. The blue color of the Holy Spirit's robe, let's see, wait a minute, there's blue in all of these, but the blue color of the sun's robe symbolizes divinity, the brown color represents earth, his humanity, and the gold, he's got a gold sash on, that represents the kingship of God. And that actually uh, is reflected uh, or, or reflects um, a verse in Revelation um, thir uh, 113 that says, And in the midst of the Lamb stands, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. And then the blue color of the Holy Spirit's robe symbolizes divinity. And then uh, somebody mentioned that they were holding staffs or reeds or something, right? I don't think they're spears, but um, the reeds are, the reeds represent authority lightly held, um, and which is referenced in Matthew and Isaiah, actually, as a bruised reed will not break. So symbolically, that um, the, the reeds that they all are holding represent authority, lightly held. Right? So yes, the questions we've asked are, where are their beards, right? That's why we think of them as feminine, maybe. Are they masculine, feminine, neither, both? So going back to something somebody else said, how many figures are represented here? So um, one in the, in the sense of the Holy Trinity, or the three in one, right? Or three if you're looking at this literally. Or as Kathy said, because there's a space, an inviting space in front, four. The three at the table and you, because you are brought into this, this image, this event, and you are the fourth there, so. Okay. So, um, as I said, icons were painted um, uh, in, in Europe and uh, during the Byzantine era, and um, were almost imbibed with a, with a holy sense, um, often were altarpieces, et cetera. Then there was this whole big um, revolution that went on. So the word icon means an image representing um, a holy scene or a holy person, right? Iconoclast or iconoclasm was the counter to that. And uh, in Europe, um, there were, there were, people even within the Christian uh, faith who took very literally God's commandment not to make an idol, not to make an image of anything holy. And so the iconoclasts, they were, as they were called, would, um, would go to the churches and destroy or deface these pieces in order to um, erase any kind of uh, holy, uh, I, idol worship. 
So that, that has happened periodically throughout history. I'm going to show you another, another icon, one more, and then we'll wrap up. Oh, that's a, up close. I did some up close, so I forgot. All right. Oh, this, this shows the perspective lines coming in. All right. There we go. By an unknown Coptic iconographer, this is Christ and the abbot Mina. What do we see? Two men with very wide open eyes, right? Yeah. The man on the right has his arm around the man on the left and, and his hand on his shoulder, right? There are halos around both of them. The man has a book, yes. What does the other man have in his hand? A scroll, yes. The one man is barefoot, yes. They're wearing robes. They're beard, beard. Okay, there's writing there, yep. And if we could read Greek, or Egyptian, I'm not sure what, I think this might be written in Egyptian. The, the writing on the right-hand side um, translates in English to Savior, and the writing on the left-hand side translates into Father Mina, garden, guardian. So, I mean, just like Rene Marguerite did, he wrote on the painting, right, and then <laughs> help gave us some, um, some signal as to who is who, that would mean that the rightmost figure is Christ and the leftmost figure is Father Mina or Abbot Mina, right? Um, look in the middle at the very top. There's a cross, yeah. So Father Mina not only is holding a uh, scroll, but his other hand is in that iconic uh, pose of a blessing. So he's making a blessing. What do we feel when we look at this painting? Solemn. Okay, not lifelike. They know something. I did bad. They know something. They know something that you did bad. Um, okay. They're in the headlights. Yeah. I do feel, I feel a little bit of serenity with this. And I do feel, again, because they're facing me, I feel included. I feel included in part of the scene for me. So the, the eyes, people are focusing on the eyes. It's an interesting thing. Um, again, as with the other painting where, they, where the iconographer used reverse perspective, to, to break the realism of the painting, um, to move us away from um, this is not the thing, right? This is not a pipe, that kind of a thing, to, to let us know that this is a, an, uh, 
a representation, an image, not a realistic painting. Iconographers often made enlarged heads and enlarged eyes in particular. It was a, it was a, a type of um, style that they, that they did, um, particularly with wise people, wise men, right? So that's why they're looking at us like that. Yeah. Okay. Jesus's hair is brown. Abbot's hair is gray. This was representing the end of his life, actually. Um, Jesus is okay. One is slightly taller than the other. That also shows a little bit of. Um, uh, can't think of the word, uh, ordinal or, uh, organization there. Superiority, yep, thanks. Um, the background consists of hills with a sunset sky from which the halos of the figures seem to be rising, right? So Jesus is holding a Bible, an ornate, ornately designed Bible with jewels. So, the other thing, if you look closely at the halo on Jesus, it's got the cruciform on it, right? That's another symbol that that figure is, that indicates that that figure is Jesus. So we talked about the eyes, you know, what is the shape and the direction of the energy between the two figures? Where is the energy directed? Right, that's kind of like a, um, that, that's almost an introductory type of a thing. Here's my friend, Father Abbott. I'm bringing him to you. I want you to you know, treat him appropriately, my, my pal, right? Yeah, that's, that's good, yeah. Jesus saying, I am with you. I also think the energy is directed at Bruce, and they're saying, you did something wrong, buddy. <laughs> but again, we all bring to, the, to, the, to these images, you know, um, our own personal points of view. And uh, I do think that they are looking at us, looking at me, you know. They're including me in this. And whether, whether they're there to accuse or whether they're there to include you and say, you know, this is my friend, Father Abbott, you know, or, or um, you know, what they're bringing, their energy is focused out at us, right? It's not off distant speculation or it's not the angels sitting around contemplating what they are. There's very strong energy coming at us. They look tired, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm curious what we think about these two icons, the, um, the Rublev icon uh, or this, and or this icon. Uh, personally, how do, we, how do we feel about these two pieces of art? Okay. They're not there. Yeah, they don't inspire you to to um, to worship them. Yeah. So I'm 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 going to summarize what what my friend um, Ron Rosenau. Uh, as says uh, about these paintings, all four of these paintings, but particularly the two icons. Um, appreciating iconography does not come easily for many Protestant and Reformed and, and reform tradition people because 
You know, we, we look at faith differently than they did in 400, 500 AD, you know, in Europe. Um, in its extreme expression, this lack of appreciation has resulted in image-smashing rampages and literal defa defacement of art. So, um, you know, uh, defacement of, of art and defacement of religious art has happened between religions, Islam and Christianity, Judaism and Christianity, etc. But in the case of some of these pieces, this is within Christianity. Some Christians feeling that icons shouldn't be part of our religious um, processes and stuff, you know, our, our faith. Um, so it's very internal, it's interesting. In this class, we've contemplated two great icons with a view toward recovering an appreciation of the spiritual tradition. And um, there's a intentional distortion, the concept of intentional distortion through reverse um, perspective or through uh, non-realistic portrayal, large eyes, things, large heads and stuff like that. Um, it, it helps to uh, draw, draw us into um, the divinity of the paintings rather than, um, ra rather than worship them as um, idols, right? And the question is, do we gaze on icons or do they gaze on us? And there's a lot of energy in many of these, and I think we feel that. Some of them gaze on us. So that will wrap for this week. Um, next week and the week following, Don's teaching a class on being Presbyterian, right? <laughs> and then we'll resume in a few weeks and continue our exploration of, of art. Thank you for being here.